So I'm going to help out and do some of the IWS ones as well. Okay, the first IWS topic is the tactical video distribution to shipboard consoles, video walls, and tablets. Um, IWS is looking for to have that capability to disseminate information quickly um, to a variety of consoles, video walls, and secure tablets throughout the ship. Um, this would allow the decision makers on board to have all the information they need in a almost real-time fashion, um, as opposed to them having to run up to the CIC and gather the information there. Um, this would in turn increase the survivability of both the crew and the ship because they'd be able to make on-the-fly decisions as opposed to you know, spending that extra however long it takes for them to get to a point where they can make that decision physically on the ship. Uh, the point of contacts are uh, Scott uh, Bewley, his, his number is 202-781-2571, um, and the technology manager for this one is Doug, Douglas Marker, and I can get you his information um, after we get out here. And lastly for me is the additive manufacturing for microwave vacuum uh, device, of, of devices. Um, we're really looking at cost reductions here. Um, with an aging fleet, Obviously, some of these legacy components are getting harder and harder to come by. Um, the manufacturers that we usually go to have to change over their manufacturing lines. Um, it's a long, drawn-out process, which becomes both expensive cost and in schedule. Um, so in order to produce these, um, I mean, excuse me, having the ability to just print these out uh, would drastically drive down the cost because we could do it when we need them. Um, and not having to do, not having to go to these uh, companies for uh, for things that they really don't make that much anymore of. So uh, just being able to produce them as we need them would be, uh, you know, would be would be pretty great. <laughs> yeah. um, the point of contact is uh, Larry Dressman, and he is at eight one two eight five four four eight zero four. And again, Douglas Marker is the TM, and I can get you his information later on. Is it for me? <laughs> okay, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, stand in for the rest of the <clears throat> IWS uh, topics. And, um, and, and this one is uh, shipboard cabling using rugged wavelength division multiplexing. Um, now, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm a nuts and bolts kind of guy, but... Um, as I uh, noodled my way through the topic, it turns out that uh, what they're really trying to solve is uh, the fact that ships today have got these long, braided, thick cables that have been pulled throughout the ships. And as part of the modernization process, they are, they are not doing any good. They want to move to like a fiber uh, you know, infrastructure to be able to support the modernization and also new construction uh, ships. Uh, to take advantage of the throughput and what you can do with COTS. The problem they have today is that when they, if they run the infrastructure, now they have all these cables that have like RS-232 interfaces, synchro interfaces, NTDS interfaces, etc. And so they have this problem of being able to, uh, if you run the infrastructure without modifying all the interfacing gear to it, now you got a problem of, well, how do I connect all this stuff together? So uh, they're trying to come up with an innovative approach uh, to handle all the, but I, I guess I would call digital to digital or synchro to digital to optical interfaces to be able to get to the fiber optic networks they want to run. Um, so uh, I'm sure what they're trying to do is come up with a lower cost uh, approach uh, for handling ship vaults. Just as a little background, uh, during ship alts, cabling is probably the most expensive element to be able to run on a ship because every drawing that a cable gets pulled through requires a revision, even if it's not, uh, you know, the site of the, uh, you know, the receiver and the, uh, the transmitter, so to speak, on opposite ends. So it's very expensive. They're trying to figure out how they can avoid having to change that. Um, the points of contact here are uh, uh, Dave Berlin and... Uh, at 202-330-9500, uh, or Dave Gornish, 202-781-0928. <clears throat> but uh, uh, 
they're just trying to get a get a head start on new construction ships so that they'll have a lower life cycle cost. And then, uh, particularly in the surface world, the second half of the ship's uh, life, uh, being able to uh, keep modernization and tech insertion occurring. Um, this is uh, when it's an efficient, low cost, uh, low loss combiner technology. Um, and again, I come from more, of, it's a radar system approach. I come from the, uh, from the acoustics uh, viewpoint. But it looks to me that this is a, um, what they're trying to do <coughs> um, uh, for AMDR. And so our friends from Raytheon will be the landing pad or somebody that would be an ideal candidate to work with on this one. As they're trying to come up with a much more efficient uh, trans, my word, a transmitter and a receiver. Uh, so that there's much more that gets exerted in the actual uh, radar signals going out and coming back as compared to heat. They're trying to do a much denser packaging of the transmit and receive uh, components in the radar arrays, uh, and they need, in order to be able to do that and handle the thermal dimension, they need to make the units much more efficient. Um, they seem to be uh, betting on this gallium nitride based uh, transmit receive modules um, and uh, trying to figure out how to how to get them uh, efficient enough. So like I say, landing pad is AMDR. Uh, Douglas Marker is, is the IWS uh, manager. We'll get you his names, but uh, Larry Dressman uh, is at 815-854-3679. And uh, the second author is uh, Brian Mitzdarfer at 812-854-5264. And I don't recognize those, uh, those telephone numbers, but uh, uh, well, I would have thought they were like Dahlgren, but I'm not sure where they might be located. Uh, they're Crane? Yep. Okay. So... Um, what they're doing is trying to get more, more packaging. You get higher uh, directivity index and uh, uh, be able to get more accurate radar systems. So um, this is the theater mission planner. Uh, this is uh, coming out of uh, IWS-5, uh, IWS-7T. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, the, when, when we talk theater mission planning, Think of uh, somebody who's in charge of a battle group in an area trying to figure out how they're going to do certain functions and planning that with all the assets in, your, in the theater. So think somebody's on a submarine, he's, or somebody's on, let's say, a carrier who's got a submarine uh, at their disposal, surface ships at their disposal, and uh, they're trying to figure out how they can accomplish their mission given those assets that they have. So what they... Right now, it seems to be done by more experience and uh, instincts as compared to uh, a real, uh, call it measurable, quantifiable approach. So what they're trying to do is if you picture uh, 360 degrees around uh, this, this environment that you're in, you've got below surface and you've got above surf on the water and then you've got airplanes. So you've got to coordinate if you were going to prosecute an ASW, anti-submarine warfare mission, you'd say, all right, based on this submarine's and its inherent capabilities, how would I want it to search certain areas? And what capabilities will that cover in that area? Then you might take a surface ship, like an LCS with an ASW module on it that maybe does an active system search, uh, how I would have them run around. And then how, do they, how would they be used in a complementary fashion rather than a conflicting one? And then the third dimension can be airplanes. So would, if I had a P-3 flying, how do I know that that capabilities are being utilized in the best fashion? So right now, uh, I don't really know how they do this. Like I said, a lot of experience and instinct. There's uh, a lot of tactical guidance that's prepared uh, to try to help, and, and they're taught how to do this. I th the goal here is to try to figure out how you can automate this function based upon the, the systems you have as a tech, as a um, let's see, a tactical uh, design aid, aid uh, to help them figure out the best implication, best way to employ this to do specific missions. So um, 
it's a tough job that uh, somebody's got to do, and uh, and I'm sure this will be a challenging uh, effort. This is probably one of those where you really need to get somebody who's been in the driver's seat had to worry about this, as well as developing the algorithms that would uh, uh, be able to support this specific situations. Um, and like I said, this is uh, Doug Marker again, Abel Ortez at 202-781-0530. And Meg Stout, 202-781-4233. Uh, both of those are located at the Navy Yard in PEO IWS. I've had uh, worked with Meg on a number of things. She's really a good TPOC to have. Uh, I would uh, certainly uh, try her. I, not that Mr. Ortez is any less, but I just have good experience with Meg. The... Um, this is, this is kind of an interesting one. These are a lot, all these are interesting. <laughs> if you're a geek, I guess, right? Uh, but this is the situation where you have, um, that they're trying to automate the verification validation for distributed testing. And, uh, you know, in the olden days, back when I used to worry about this stuff, we all had central processors, mainframes, uh, and you used to have SimStim that tickled those interfaces of the uh, sensors that everything came together in a mainframe. And uh, uh, in those days, the, the amount of reconfiguration within those mainframes was relatively simple. Um, in today's distributed processing environments where you end up having systems of systems, uh, the challenge is much more. So if you had 50 distributed processing uh, components across six different systems on a ship, um, in order to have any, and we do this today, any display on any consoles, lots of reconfigurability within those, um, you end up with like 50 factorial combinations that can be tested and that can exist. And what we need to do is to be able to certify that they all, in fact, worked as desired in all the normal configurations and then in casualty configurations. So... It's a, it's a kind of a thing that uh, specifically in the write-up they said that, um, you know, right now from when a certified product comes out of the, or, or an accepted product comes out of the industries, it takes 18 months to run through this with a bunch of people, you know, putting, pushing buttons and mashing the, uh, the system operation uh, for 18 months before you can actually deliver this thing certified to a ship. Um, and what they're trying to do in the actual write-up is saying they just want to try to reduce it to 12 months uh, by trying to automate a lot of these functions. But, uh, so, I think they're, you know, this is one that I think we ought to really be able to exploit technology on uh, and try to help them out with. So, uh, I would uh, think that would be a nice challenging one and have a much broader application than just the specific Aegis-based uh, uh, system, which I think is what they were looking at. Um, Douglas Marker again. This time it's Ryan Moore at 401-832-3751. That's down here in Newport. Um, and Meg Stout again, uh, following that with her PEO IWS. That's the 202-781-4233. Uh, and I think... I think what they're looking for on that, uh, based upon my read of the phase one and phase two, is concepts in phase ones with some limited prototyping phase twos. But in phase uh, three, they expect to get you a full-blown uh, access to a land-based test site to be able to run that. Um, just as a, as a quick break here, you know, one of the things that your SBIR buys you is not only just access to people, but access to facilities. You, you know, we you now have a need to know, even if it even if it's just an unclassed phase one, it that's kind of your access, your reason to be able to go to the Navy Yard or go to the laboratories, meet the people, see the facilities they have, think about how you would employ them in subsequent phases of your program, and whether it be a land-based test site with a lot of electronics gear, or it could be a tow tank at Carter Rock, or it could be an EMI chamber at Newport, or it could be something in, uh, in, in Crane. That's a neat, neat tool to understand the access and the tools that you now have access to. 
Um, all right, enough paid advertisement. Next, ceramic metal and uh, joining for hypersonic vehicles and missiles. Um, apparently, we shoot things so fast <laughs> that they start to destroy, destroy the bullets en route. Uh, and as a result, they're, they, uh, we use ceramics uh, and certain components of these uh, projectiles. Uh, specifically, the, the targets uh, for these, uh, these projectiles is the Mark 45 weapon today, which I'm not familiar with. I am familiar with some of the work that's been done on the electromagnetic railgun, where these things are going to uh, go at uh, top speed. So there's uh, several problems that have to be solved in this. One is the acceleration uh, up to velocity, and then the velocity speed that it has to run and the damage that that has currently caused to, uh, to some, I guess, the test projectiles. Um, so I think there's uh, kind of a preconceived notion about mechanical interfaces uh, on this um, for using ceramic leading edges of both the projectile and any fins it has. Um, but I, I think that they're going to be wide open for any innovative approaches for coatings at large. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of work done in the ceramics area. So this is uh, being done again by uh, IWS. And uh, Curtis Martin at 301-227-4501. Uh, uh, and Dave Cook at 540-653-2379. Are the contacts and the authors on that. The uh, next one is, uh, again, another interesting one that Meg Stout's uh, engaged in. Um, this is an undersea domain multi level security data miner. Okay, I'll try to translate that, and I had to read it several times myself. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, when ships go to sea, uh, submarines in particular, they collect lots of data all the time, from literally when they're casting off the ropes to when they pull back in. That data is recorded and then provided to, uh, I think it's Johns Hopkins, who usually does a post-analysis of all the data. And then they compare that with how the crew performed during the uh, deployment. And oftentimes, they will analyze uh, these bulk data and find that there are, might have been targets, there might have been things that were missed in that, that huge data that they have captured. Um, and then we try to figure out how we're going to improve the basic system so that we don't miss them during next deployments. Um, but what, they, what this particular uh, effort is to try to figure out how you can do that in situ on the ship while you're operating. So if you're out 60 days um, and you've got 60 days worth of data, is there something that, a, uh, that could be run in a background uh, or as a separate function where you actually draw upon all the data elements that uh, you've collected for real data and then the resource materials? Because literally, apparently, uh, when, they, when they do this post-mission, they've got people with three-ring binders, they've got uh, old intel reports, they have a variety of sources at multi-levels of security. And the goal is to try to put this on board a ship. Uh, they allude to uh, perhaps using cloud computing on board a submarine uh, application for that. So this is kind of an interesting one. Um, it has a real need. Uh, the market for this is the uh, Rapid COTS Insertion Program, which means that uh, whatever you produce will probably be run against real data relatively soon um, and then uh, be employed at uh, one of the yearly upgrades that the uh, Rapid COTS Insertion Program uses. So uh, uh, this one could see much quicker returns uh, than perhaps some of the others. Uh, Pete Scala, uh, retired submarine uh, uh, Captain has uh, uh, got a special interest in this. He's at 202-781-3360. And Meg Stout uh, is 202-781-4233. Uh, uh, those are the advanced development folks for a lot of the uh, work there. 
All right. Next slide. This takes. This is another one where uh, AMDR uh, is going to be a landing pad, and this had to, has to do with advanced heat spreader technology for gallium, not gallium, gallium uh, nitrite uh, mimics and. Uh, this kind of goes back to, I think, the earlier one where they're trying to get dense packs at the transmit receive to have high efficiency combiners. Uh, this is a, another one where you use gallium nitrite. Uh, they're trying to figure out how are they going to get the heat dissipated from the chips to the uh, substrates and then out the cooling mechanisms to the fins on PC printed wired boards, etc. And um, uh, so uh, this is a looks to me to be a pretty uh, pretty straightforward for uh, getting the heat dissipated um, and from the chips itself. Uh, and this all goes back to if you're going to have them densely packed together, what heat that is not that is generated needs to be dissipated, or you're going to start having higher failure rates, uh, and that'll be unacceptable to your your active radar uh, arrays. Um, and like I said, Raytheon's uh, the AMDR developer, so um, you've got got the right talent nearby. And then this is again another one that has to do with low cost thermal management. Again, um, I don't operate much in that particular world, but I think what what occurs is the, this is more of an Aegis system uh, oriented. It's at least the example they talked about had to do with Aegis. Uh, uh, shipboard systems, um, and the fact that, uh, uh, again, it's how do we manage heat, how do we have uh, ways of cooling electronic cabinets. Uh, they talk specifically about a 15 kW rack of gear that needs to get uh, heat dissipated. The problem that, of course, a lot of these systems run into is that they're operating near the equator and the, uh, you know, the, a lot of hot areas over it off the coast of Africa and, and uh, the Middle East uh, where the temperatures are substantially higher. The water that surface ships have access to for cooling is already 100 degree water. And uh, so what's they're having to put on a lot more chilling systems and uh, power systems for running the chilled water cooling systems in that uh, tough environment. So they're trying to figure out how they can do better uh, thermal management at large on platforms that have lots of process and power and lots of heat generated. So, uh, th but these are not at the card level or at the combiner level, and it's not efficiencies. They're just looking for innovative approaches. And uh, David Berlin at 202-330-9500, and David Gornish at uh, 202-789, excuse me, 781-0928 are the uh, authors on that. So um, with that, my voice is about done, and I'm going to move <laughs>